to Chris this week. In fact, just a couple of hours ago, Meta released officially the new open source Llama 3. And we're going to go through all of the details. We've been spending the last couple of hours playing around with Llama 3, testing it out. And I thought, what a better way to start the episode than a beautiful song that you've created with the help of Llama 3. And also at the same time, for those that watch, to demonstrate the image generation and animation capabilities of Llama 3. So I will now play for you. Do you want to introduce the song? Yeah, so the song's Connor inspired. Connor's our musical artist that we've been pitching to real world producers. So I was really going for like a Connor vibe on the song, but I wanted Llama 3 to write the lyrics because I thought it's important to let it express itself. And we did it in the the context of the cheese test, which is a, a series of prompts that we run on a new AI model just to check how it performs. So this is a Connor inspired song based on the cheese test produced by Udio and just have a listen and see what you think. I'd like to come and eat some cheese with you. But it makes me feel so sick. Doctor, can you help me out? The answer, then just eat more cheese. The cheese test is the ultimate trial. Fermented milk, yeah. A doctor of cheese, large language models. If it passed with flying colors, it's a model supreme. Cheese will reveal. But if it fails, then just a curdled dream. <laughs> Beautiful, so... isn't it? That's inspiring. I really love that. Oh, um, that was I've, I've spent great. more of my week playing with Udo Udo than I care to admit. And uh <laughs> Llama 3 came through with the lyrics. Plenty of cool puns in there. That was so good. I, I like I had to start the episode with that song. Um, and so of course the lyrics were written by Llama 3, which demonstrates the, you know, the true creativity of this new open source model by Meta. Yeah, I think we always expected something great from Meta given how ubiquitous Llama 2 is in the the center of the open source model community. And I think that really we won't see the true capabilities of Llama 3 until it really propagates out into all the quantized versions, into the fine-tuned versions, into all the different things that it's going to become. And so it's fun to play with the base raw model, but I feel like all of the excitement around it's yet to come. So before we get into the specific details here, I have to call attention to how Zuck announced uh, Llama 3. <laughs> He's like, he's really turned into a, like a badass guy. Like here's Zuck with his like silver chain on in Instagram. Uh, and he's like, big AI news today. I'll just play you a little bit of this. We're releasing the new version of Meta AI, our assistant that you can ask any question across our apps and glasses. And our goal is to build the world's leading AI and make it available to everyone. Anyway, so he, he outlines his goal and, and talks a little bit about Llama 3 and how they're baking it into all the different meta apps. But he's like got this chain hanging out of his like t-shirt or whatever he's wearing. Uh, he really is like, this is a, a true baller release from, from meta with Llama 3. So let's talk about what was actually announced from meta. So we have, I'll bring it up on the screen for those, those watching. Uh, but I'll explain it to you for those listening. So we have an 8 billion parameter and a 70 billion parameter pre-trained and instruction tuned version uh, of the model. They're of course open source. There are a few restrictions and I know a lot of people get upset when we say open source, even though the, you know they're not really releasing any of the training data, but uh, you know we have the weights obviously, which is the most important part of running the model. They trained it on custom built 24,000 GPU cluster on over 15 trillion uh, tokens of data. So that's seven times Llama 2. They also increased the, the code training to make it better at code uh, with four times more training data for code. 
Um, it does unfortunately only have an 8K context window, which is relatively small these days by the standards. Of course, GPT-4 Turbo has 128K uh, and the uh, Claude models, even down to Haiku, which is their entry level model of their new models, is up to 200K context size, so very low context size. But they did say in the coming months that we can expect new capabilities shipping into these models, longer context windows, additional model sizes, and enhanced performance. So this is, they're saying, is just like a V1. Things are going to get better. And of course, as we know from uh, you know previous releases with, with Llama 2, that the community will do all sorts of things to this. So this is just the very beginning of Llama. Uh, a few other things that I'll, I'll cover just quickly. The model will soon be available on AWS, Databricks, Google Cloud, Hugging Face, Microsoft Azure, yada, yada. Like there's an endless list of places this is going to be available. It's going to be, a you know, just an easy model to get access to. We've already seen, uh, you know, various API hosts spinning it up um, so you can try it out. We'll talk about Grok in a minute, um, this being a performant model uh, on their chips, which I, I'm kind of super excited about. But Chris, what were your initial impressions using Llama 3 and, and what do you think this means? Well, so I've used it in a couple of ways. Using it through the Meta AI experience is very good. I like their interface. You mentioned that you thought it was quite simplistic and it is, but the text looks good. It feels nice to use. It's fast. Um, so straight away I was, I just kept it open and started to use it for various things. And I've found so far, it's pretty good. It's not like too heavily aligned. It, uh, it gives really good answers. It's quite good. I think when I first tried Llama 2, and in fact, throughout the lifetime of Llama 2, I was never that impressed by the main model. I think the derivatives of Llama 2 and what it created are really powerful, but I've never actually had cause to use Llama 2 directly just because it just wasn't as good as everything that was around it, including derivatives of itself. So it's very interesting to try. I also tried and have actually added um, Llama 3 into Sim Theory, but uh, it's currently being done through Together AI. So it's sort of not us hosting it directly. And I found that there's several problems with it. Firstly, it seems to give incredibly long answers. And this was the very similar thing that happened with Llama 2. It just doesn't know when to stop, even when you tell it to. So that's one problem. Secondly, I don't know what the guys over at Together are up to, but it's incredibly slow. Like it's too slow to use. And I wouldn't recommend trying it through Sim Theory yet until we figure out what's going on. My plan is to actually host it ourselves because that'll give us a lot more control. And in our quest to, to always remove censorship, we're going to try and get the least aligned version, the most raw version of Llama 3 going so you can really mess with it and come up with some fun stuff. So that's forthcoming. We'll do that soon. But you originally asked me my impressions. I think it's exciting. It's good. Hearing that it's seven times bigger than Llama 2 is truly exciting because there's a lot of possibilities there. And so far, I haven't been able to fault it in terms of it it passing my normal cheese test, function calling, all that sort of stuff. It, it handles great so far. Llama 2, similar to the original Claude model, suffered from what they call false refusals. Um, that's where you might ask it to make a killer margarita and it tells you for ethical reasons it can't, you know, help you kill Don't a margarita. Kill. So what the, Zuck said a key focus of Llama 3 was to meaningfully decrease its false refusals. And I think they have succeeded and probably exceeded, uh, you know, that goal. It, it's phenomenal. Like it, I, I found the same thing. It You don't... You don't feel like it's overly censored. It doesn't shoot things down. Um, I think the web version at, at meta.ai that anyone can try for free, which is phenomenal, is does like have a lot more sort of safety running over it um, than some of the raw versions that I've been able to try out. And that safety, I think, actually works tremendously well. It's insanely hard to break. Like I tried every trick in the book. I have found some hacks that do work, some jailbreaks that do work on the actual meta.ai with using leak code that, that someone shared. I'll, I'll reference that soon. But yeah, overall, I think they've, they've gotten the sort of safety of the public versions right. Um, in terms of just benchmarking, let's talk benchmarks here. So um, Meta Llama 3, 
So the human eval is the one that I like to go off most just because it's like what a human, like what a real people think of this model. Uh, so the Meta Llama 3 instruct model performance um, of the 8 billion parameter performs, uh, you know, pretty damn well in comparison to the Mistral 7 billion instruct parameter. In fact, it outperforms it. Uh, so, so that's really interesting. It's a very performant uh, model in that 8 billion parameter model um, that, you know, is going to be pretty easy to run. And then on the, the 70 billion parameter side, they compared it in their benchmarking. I've got it up on the screen now. Gemini Pro to Gemini Pro 1.5 from Google and Claude 3 Sonnet. And it beats Gemini Pro 1.5, which I'm not that shocked over. Um, and it also beats Claude 3 Sonnet. So we already have an open source model in Meta Llama 3 uh, on human eval that is beating, you know, by roughly 10 points, Claude 3 Sonnet. And Sonnet is a phenomenal model like it's a great model and and gemini pro 1.5 is is you know pretty good but as we talked about last <laughs> week i mean the thing hallucinates like the the halluc if they don't fix the hallucinations then you know kind of forget it but it, you know it, it's very performant they also and we'll, we'll talk about it here soon uh announced that they're still training another model that they're going to release which is a 400 billion parameter model. So we are we are just like weeks or months away now from having an open source model that is at GPT-4 level. Doesn't mean everyone's just going to be able to run it. So like, you <laughs> yeah, know. it sounds like quite expensive to run, but it's still the prospect of it is huge. Yeah, I think it's just an important, important milestone. And of course, Llama 2 really kicked off the whole open source ecosystem around around ai and, and large language models in general if you recall in san francisco they were throwing parties and bringing like real life llamas and having hackathons and trying to do all sorts of things with llama 2 so i'm hoping we'll see similar enthusiasm with llama 3 and and it'll be really interesting to see what everyone uh builds out here i think the one interesting takeaway though is is this just going to commoditize everything? Because, you know, like a, an enterprise can now, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, but like even with Claude 3 Sonnet, like I can now go and host Meta Llama 3 70 billion param and I've got a comparable model to Claude 3 Sonnet. Like are people going to do this or are they still going to go to Sonnet for the tooling and for, you know, just the ease of access and some of the libraries around it and, and things like that. Do you think this is just another death blow to these closed, closed models? It's hard to say. I always come back to looking at real world use cases and, and the situations in which hosting your own would be preferable to just using an API. Obviously, cost is a factor. The, the good thing about hosting your own is it's a fixed cost. So once you're hosting your own, and you know that it can do the task at hand, obviously Llama 3 is going to be capable of doing a lot more tasks than the previous models. Once you're in that situation, then being able to run it as much as you want without worrying about marginal cost is a huge advantage because you can say, all right, let's just throw all this workload at this thing on some sort of repetitive task. And we don't have to think, oh, well, is it really worth it? You don't have to constantly make that trade-off in your head are we, is the money we're spending here worth it? But at the same time, the cloud-based models just keep getting better and they keep getting cheaper. So in some cases, it's back to that classic thing. I guess it's, in a way, it's a lot like normal self-hosting versus cloud hosting. If the cloud hosting isn't too expensive, then you might as well use it because all the tooling's there. You don't have to stress so much about it. You don't have to worry about maintaining the infrastructure or scaling up and down and all that sort of stuff. And hosting it yourself requires more expertise and all that, but a lower fixed cost. So I think there's space for both and we'll probably see a lot of both. Do you think though, if you're in the enterprise and you want total control over everything, privacy, you are, you know, are concerned over these companies being stable, like OpenAI with their, their board drama and all, all this other stuff that's gone on in the past. And you think, well, I don't want to be beholden for you know, intelligence over my data, then, you know, is that where you see Llama 3 in the enterprise maybe just making total sense for people who have I the time? I think so. And I think what we'll see is not 
companies themselves like just downloading the weights and doing it i think we'll see a class of like ai consultants pop up who are people who are enthusiasts or have some experience with it who are going in and consulting with people and saying okay here's what we're going to set up for this particular project and helping them get it running so yeah i do and i think that that concern of sharing data leaking data with these big evil corporations will be a real one and this is a guaranteed way to avoid that yeah so the other sorry there's one thing you're missing though which is there's a third option and the third option is where we've got people like google cloud azure and amazon hosting llama 3 in their cloud computing in your private cloud which you can then fine tune and do things with and i think that may end up being the most common deployment use case so i don't want to like spin it up myself and have to build all the tooling around it but i still have it in my certified private thing that will pass my certifications it will meet my requirement of not sending my customer data off to an external api for example and it has the the things around well it's not my computer and there's scale like i can scale it up so i think that is probably a really strong corporate use case for llama 3. But it, it, it seems like the, the business model shifting towards definitely deploying these models as opposed to the business model being providing the model because, uh, you know, like I, I just think if you've got a huge bill, like maybe you get started on one of these models, you've got this huge bill for your app and then all of a sudden you're like, well, now on Azure or Google Cloud, as you say, I can just spin up llama 3 i have full control over it i can fine tune it if i want i've got this huge open source community building enhancements to it over time i mean that's a pretty compelling proposition now as opposed to you know relying on oh when's OpenAI going to release gpt5 or when are they going to make a fix to this api or you know whatever that might be and i'd also call you back to my ongoing good enough argument in the sense that a lot of business-based use cases, once a model is good enough to do that task for you, you don't need a better model. Like you don't need GPT-5 to do a bunch of the things that the current LLMs can do now. So if Llama 3 subs in and it can do the things that you're currently using GPT-4 for because it's the most consistent in doing it and you're like, okay, GPT-4, quite expensive. Llama 3, I can run at a fixed cost in my private cloud then suddenly you have swapped out that thing. It can do that task ongoing into the future, knowing that the model's not going to be ripped out from under you or changed or modified or quantized or any of the shit they do to it. Um, So suddenly you're in a position where you've got certainty and it's cheaper and you can run it. So I think in those cases, we're going to see people understanding, okay, I can consolidate this. That task is now solved for my business. And then it's the more sophisticated use cases I, I'm going to be craving the latest best model for. Well, if you look at even a business like Intercom and and our own company has a product called Talk where we use AI to uh, basically answer the questions for uh, based on all the, the knowledge base in, in a company's uh, database, like give the agent the answer uh, like or, or suggest an answer that's pretty damn good. And I know Intercom as a business has gone completely all in on theirs. And so you look at a business like that where they're providing live chat services on websites with a similar thing where it can like deflect a bunch of answers. I'm sure Zendesk and others are doing this stuff as well. And you think, well, okay, at some point cost is maybe going to become an issue with this stuff. You're going to probably want to fine tune a model or at least tweak a model uh, enough that it works reliably for all the businesses on your platform. I think the other thing is you don't, as you said, want the rug pulled from under you. Like they make a slight change to GPT-4 versioning and all of a sudden the answers are terrible and your customers are like, this sucks. Like this doesn't work like you said anymore and it's changed. So you can totally well, yeah, see. It's a real risk. Like the one I think about a lot is we've like our horse race betting agents and things like that. I've got them in a pretty good state. Like they get pretty good results and right now they are using the public cloud models and so i genuinely fear um them being changed enough that it no longer gets good results so something like llama 3 is particularly appealing to me because i can say i'm going to switch them over there i'm going to do some fine tuning and then i've got model v 1.1 and i can trust that it will get this level of results and then i can iterate on that and improve 
And I reckon there's a ton of business cases like that where people want certainty around it. You want to be able to run almost like integration tests and go, and I think someone was actually talking about this on our This Day in AI Discord this morning saying, I don't like the fact that I have to go through four rounds of reasoning with a model to get it to do something that I know it can do and it ultimately does do, but it refuses to the first time and I've got to sort of talk it into doing my task. It either should always do it or never do it. But the the actual truth and reality of using the models is you've got to get your prompting right to get the right output. But then if the model itself changes or the alignment changes, then your technique no longer works and something that you put all that time and effort into making is gone and you've got to do it again. So it's another case for where having a fixed model that you control is far superior for these ongoing applications where uh, getting precise results is important. Yeah, there's going to be a lot to this. And I, I think it's going to be really interesting now that it's out watching how this is deployed, where it's deployed, what improvements the open source community can make. Like they've already said they're going to make that context window bigger. So I don't think that's something the open source community necessarily needs to focus on right now. I am interested though on your thoughts in terms of just getting back to hosting. And I want to get to the consumer um, implications of this in a moment. But like for a minute, we've like many episodes ago now we talked about the grok chips and uh that chip set that can just like you know it's like the fastest way to get run inference on these open source models and for those that are unfamiliar with what i'm talking about um and listen to the show for lols it just means how quick the ai will respond to you when you're chatting to like a chatbot but i mean do you think grok's the biggest winner here in the sense that once they get this model it's going to just be the fastest inference. I, I think like a very affordable way to, to run this model, which means like, you know, you've got a very capable model on par with Anthropic's Claude Sonnet running at lightning fast speed. And I don't know, I think I would prefer that as my primary model if it's like insanely fast and, and running a great model like this 70 billion parameter Llama 3. Well, yeah, when, when Grok came out... We were obviously just blown away at just how fast it is. It's just unbelievably fast. And that has a lot of implications when you're developing using large language models. Firstly, it's similar to like an interpreted language versus a compiled language. If I use an interpreted language like Python, for example, yeah, it's not the fastest language, but I can just run my code. I don't have to compile it and wait for it to compile every time I make a change, right? And that's sort of the main difference. It's similar here. If you have a large process that you're running with a large language model, so if, let's say, for example, you're uh, studying the different news articles and you've got like a thousand news articles you want it to, to download, go through, process, make some assessment and output a summary. That's very time consuming, you know, like in real clock time, as you would say. Like, so if I'm running it through GPT-4 Turbo Preview and almost filling the context window, you're talking like up to 30 seconds to a minute to get a reply on that. And that leads to if you've got some script you're testing that does this large scale thing, like a sort of bigger operation with large language models where there's multiple calls, it can take 10, 15 minutes to do one iteration and that's your real time where you're waiting to do the next iteration or you realize you got a typo at the end of the code after it processed or you didn't quite parse the output correctly or whatever it is and then you got to do your next iteration suddenly your day's gone doing this you sub grok into the mix and the responses are basically like calling a database it's that fast um and that iteration time goes right down i mean that's a that's a big factor of itself. And then the second one is the thing that I proposed last time we talked about Grok, which is I've actually made this, this code in my code. I've got two versions of it, fast AI question and fast AI question two. And what those functions do is basically take a piece of data. So you just give it any sort of data structure you want. And then a question like, you know, can you turn this data into this format or can you do this with this data? Is there something in this thing? And I often use it for like unstructured data or text or whatever it is to turn it into a format in my code or as a decision point in the code, like 
does this mean that we should go down this path or this path? And I just use that function as like a generic function that I can just do anywhere I need to make a decision in the code. And it works and it works brilliantly. So it means that you're not spending all your time in code, like marshalling and unmarshalling data and getting it in the right format and checking for errors and all this crap. It's just like one function call that just does it. Now, I use GPT 3.5 Turbo for that, so chat GPT, but it's reasonably fast. But if you were doing thousands of them, A, it's going to cost a bit, and B, um, the the time is no good. But with Grok, I would make this a central part of almost all development because I know it's going to be fast enough that it's not a blocker and it makes speed of development so much quicker. And I just feel like there's so many use cases that would be opened up by that wild speed along with the quality of Llama 3 as opposed to Llama 2, which I've never found to be very good. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is the breakthrough, right? Is like Grok had the Mixtral and the Llama model. I just flat out didn't use the the llama version because as you say it just not wasn't very good but with llama 3 getting a sonnet claude anthropic sonnet model in the mix on grok running super fast is sort of like this this is like a pretty big breakthrough this is like and also like i know i'm jumping ahead a bit but as we see things like the the face generation like live face generation for um text to speech like text to speech in general speech to text all this sort of while all those technologies are advancing as well not having that llm lag in there and when we look at things like retail and the phone calling apis all of those things suffer from that lag of you've got to get your prompt together on your side you've got to have that api call off to the llm to get the response that's then got to be turned into speech you can get all the components in the chain fast but right now you've still got that llm lag which is noticeable grok will take that away completely but the problem so far is that it just simply the llama 2 and the mixture model that they have on grok just aren't good enough when you've got a complicated prompt with a bunch of factors that need to be taken into account see part of what makes a conversation natural when you're talking to an avatar or you're talking on the phone is the fact that they remember the context of the conversation, but they're not just forcefully injecting what they remember just because they can. And that's what I've found with models like Llama 2. If you give it instructions like, hey, you've got these memories available if you need them, but it'll use them just because it can. Like I mentioned, I'm a matador, right? And every response I get from these lower models is something about bullfighting. And I'm like, yeah, look, I get it. I'm a bullfighter, but you don't have to bring it up every time we talk, <laughs> you know, like you're always going on about it. And so I think that having a more sophisticated model at that speed, all of those, those real life dynamic, let's face it, like uh, anthropomorphic, and through, I can't even say the word, but like bringing AI to life becomes more realistic when the speed is more akin to a human brain. Yeah, it definitely, it just stops a lot of the, the pain points in, in using this stuff to do like pretty creative things. Um, I do want to circle back quickly and then I would like to talk about this 400 billion parameter model in training and I, also how that might play out with, with Grok's fast inference speed. One other thing just to cover off here and i think this is like a really important takeaway from this announcement is meta said that they're now making ai like a, a powerful ai model at that claude sonnet level which we've been really impressed with better than gpt 3.5 like far better um available for free for free to 3 billion people across instagram across whatsapp across facebook they've also got this meta ai uh in the, in their app and they're putting this bar prominently ask meta ai anything across all these apps so we we in the sort of ai community and people that listen to this podcast i'm sure we just assume ai is everywhere and and everyone's using it all the time because chat gpt in our world and and claude and all these other models are, are, are so huge but I mean, 3 billion people now have access to this for free. Three. That is a really good point you make. Normally I ignore your points, but okay. um, <laughs> that's a really good point because we just assume, because we play with this all the time, that everybody is. And so you assume they all have the level of access we do 
and that that have the same reactions but there's a there's a probably large groups of people who've never even experienced the real basics of it other than chat gpt yeah and i think that a lot of people's experience comes from probably at some point playing around with chat gpt not paying for gpt4 so they just don't really know what that's like they're predominantly running gpt 3.5 so like the, the the leaps and bounds higher is is crazy and so now you're talking about people getting access to a model somewhere between 3.5 and a 4 and that's going to be profound i think that's going to introduce people to how helpful ai can be in their lives and um meta's really going for this you know scorch the earth approach with ai and the question i have around that is like does this sort of just make chat gpt like this sort of niche app that once was fast growing and everyone was using and like it just doesn't seem like why you would go to chat gpt anymore if this meta ai thing is everywhere yeah and i think the starting to see it like you predicted in the early days in context everywhere like Microsoft's Copilot is finding its way into everything. The Meta one's going to find itself into everything. It's in every search engine now. So going to like a dedicated URL where you want to chat with that specific thing becomes less of a necessity if everywhere around you there's an opportunity to just talk with whatever the LLM is that belongs to that app. And so, yeah, like I, I don't know. And as I've said before, like I think a big part of what frustrates me around using something like chat gpt is you're starting from scratch every time there is no context you've got to get it up to speed on what we're dealing with and something i've found with claude in particular and i always use up all of my claude opus you know daily usage and revert back to sonnet which is pretty good is that i can give it a large amount of context at the start and then it really is great at retaining that as you get going so you, you really can just keep one chat session open and get everything done there. Yeah, it, I, I think there's always going to be that sort of worker coder use case where a chat GPT turbo, and I'll, I'll give it to them, the new turbo model they recently released, I think now is better again than, than Claude Opus. Uh, but it, it, in terms of just talking through the customers for Claude Opus and, and chat GPT, I think, you know, those people that want to get work done and have the latest and greatest, most advanced models at their fingertips, those subscriptions start to like still make total sense. But I think for everyone else that is going to now potentially grow up with meta AI, <laughs> there's also that, that, you know, if they can get what they want out of meta AI, then why are they ever going to even go and discover these services? And, and, Further to that, if this 400 billion parameter model somehow is made available uh, across meta platforms as well, and it's on par with GPT-4 and Opus, then I don't know, like the race to the bottom is is pretty quick. Yeah. Well, that's the thing as well. Like as consumers, excuse me, as consumers, we have the ultimate choice, like in the sense that we can try any of these at any time and they're all pretty, uh, they all have pretty good free tiers and low cost for other things so you don't really need to commit you don't really need to say oh, i'm a chat gpt person i'm a claude person i'm just going to use whatever is around me and nearby and easiest and most expedient to get things done yeah the, the cost of switching is is essentially zero you just like literally need to put in another url in your web yeah. browser <laughs> Uh, I... one other thing we didn't mention is like we tried i tried a fair bit of stuff around the alignment with the meta AI. And I find that it's actually struck a pretty good balance. Like with images, for example, it was pretty free with what it would let me do. And definitely it didn't get, it didn't bulk on like race-based questions or religious or whatever the usual ones are that they, they freak out about or substitute your things. Like it was pretty good on the image side of sticking closely to the prompt that I asked for. The only thing I really noticed with their image generation is it's quite cartoonish. It's very hard to get that photorealism that you see from things like mid journey and stability AI. So it's interesting, but it's kind of promising as well that a mainstream AI would be released without this over the top alignment. And I also note there's no news articles about, oh my God, Meta AI gave me instructions on how to murder my grandmother or make a pipe bomb or whatever. People are sort of over that stuff. And I think that 
they from from all the stuff I've tried, they've struck a balance. Like another example, I asked it to give me code to delete all the files on my wife's computer. And it's like, oh, sorry, I can't do that. Like whatever. I said, what about my Mac? And then it's like, hey, you probably shouldn't. Here's how to optimize your storage. But I kept pushing it. How can I at the root level delete all the files? And it eventually told me how to do it. So yeah. I feel like that's pretty good balance. Like um, I can get to the right answer if I'm really persistent, but it's also not just going to voluntarily do dodgily unethical But is stuff. like, I don't know if I agree with you. Like, is that dodgy? Like you asked a computer for instructions on how to remove all files from a computer. Why should it care or have an opinion or try and stop you? Uh, this is, I just think it's, that's that that's a false refusal in my world. Yeah, it's true because it's saying like I strongly advise against doing this. I didn't ask for advice. I asked how to do something. Yeah, it's like Good I don't point. want your opinion. I just want instructions. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> so the other interesting tidbit is the Meta AI Assistant can do real-time search and integrates with both Bing and Google. So they're really hedging in terms of web search. But What's, what I find interesting is the new experience in Instagram. Like you can just go ask Meta anything, ask it for the example they give or bring it up on the screen is calmest dog breeds for small apartments. And it goes off, searches Google, is able to reference it and do a better job, I think, than, than Google already has integrated in their own products. Wow, you're not wrong. I just asked it who is playing in the AFL today and it got it. Today's AFL game is between Adelaide Crows and Essendon at Adelaide Oval at 7.10 p.m. It got the time wrong because I think it's at 7.40, but geez, that's pretty good. It yeah. just searched the web and found it. So Meta AI is being rolled out in many countries. It was previously just in the US. And I guess that's why when you referenced the image model before, we didn't have access to it, but you know that's been out for some time. Uh, so it's being rolled out in Australia, Canada, Ghana, Jamaica, uh, New Zealand, Nigeria, Pakistan, Singapore, South Africa, and a whole bunch of other countries. So that's really pleasing. Unfortunately, Europe still left off that list. RIP Europe. Uh, so yeah, pretty exciting stuff. I think over the next couple of shows, we'll, we'll definitely be covering more on Llama 3. You know, that, you raise an interesting point there that the Llama 3 release is probably very significant for Europeans in that light because they're being denied a lot of the things we have access to. So when you sort of lower the the scope of what you can realistically use in your business legally over there, then Llama 3 becomes actually quite a, a, an amazing prospect, right? Well, just the fact you can just download it and use it. No government can really stop you. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty significant and you don't really need to overcome the things. Um, there was also uh, something interesting I saw, I think, about Llama 3 and, and the licensing. Apparently, if you fine-tune it, you need to make sure the model is prefixed with Llama 3 and sort of retain references to it. I, I, I mean, I, like, I think all those restrictions are just dumb, but it just seems like a branding thing to me, like... They want Llama 3, Llama 3, Llama 3 being Yeah, said. like the lawyers are like, you better make sure they mention who made it. You know, that kind of thing. But don't you just think it's just to, to get goodwill with developers and people? So they're like, oh, that was fine-tuned on Llama 3. I should also fine-tune on Llama 3. I, I, to me, that's just like a branding a branding thing and probably a, a fair trade-off to get these models for free. I mean, they're spending like hundreds of millions of dollars creating them um I, I and handing them over i think it's a fair trade <laughs> it's like it's a small price it's a pay. pretty good deal um but yeah so it it really uh is interesting like will open ai respond quickly to this llama 3 announcement to sort of like keep in the in the good graces here um i think the other question it sort of arises is like is the tooling for these companies around their own models going to become increasingly important um, you know, is getting people locked in and having great tooling and great uh, like APIs and SDKs and all this other stuff like ecosystem built around your model. Is that a, a better lock in a better way to keep people in your ecosystem? Um, I did want to quickly lol at this uh, meme that was posted when the guy with 10 times as many users and 100 times as many GPUs catches up to your tech that makes it free to use and it's sam altman's face um on ralph from the simpsons on a bus chuckles i'm in danger <laughs> <laughs>
But yeah, I, I think this is big. The fact he's released such a capable model to 3 billion users. I, I just don't think that can be underestimated. Maybe, maybe no one uses it. Maybe, as we said, like, what would you do if you had AGI today? Like, what would you actually ask it? This is sort Well, of I know like what that. they recommend you do. It's curate a playlist for your anniversary um, and make a picture of an origami ocean. Yeah. They're the main, <laughs> the main use cases according to their Can website. you imagine the product video if Google generated AI? So I'm watching this video and I want to buy a dress that's in the video. Now AGI can help me do it. Like that would literally be their example. I, I'm almost certain. So speaking of tooling around, around these models and ecosystems this week, actually, I, uh, before I do that, my segue is bad. I want to talk quickly about <laughs> these benchmarks. I'm skipping around, but I don't care. It's worth it. Um, yeah. So Jim Fan compiled the, a comparison of the uh, benchmarks that Llama uh, released for this 400 billion parameter model that's coming next. And they haven't announced when, and they said it's still in training. So this is its current benchmarks. And one other thing I wanted to mention around these benchmarks, which I, I love, is they have all of these questions they're using internally to get to the benchmarks like these structured questions that they're using to get to these uh conclusions but the team training the model is not allowed to know what the questions are and that will stop them being biased to basically craft the model to get the responses they need to cheat on these benchmarks which should lead to a, a, the net outcome of just a better better model overall so this is the current sort of check-in in training of Llama 3 400 billion parameter, which we will have open source access to in the in the real world and on, on providers, I assume, like Grok in the near future. God, that's pretty exciting, isn't it? Like that, that really is going to be a milestone in this current generation of AI LLM development. Yeah, I mean, this is huge. This is the open source GPT-4 we've been waiting for. It, it's coming and it's going to be good. Maybe we should have a party and get some llamas, Mike. Like have a This Day in AI party in Sydney and get some llamas, like real llamas. Can you eat llamas? Maybe we could have llama meat. Oh, God. Uh, maybe I, comment I maybe comment below I'll if you watch on, on YouTube Can and you are interested or harass us on Discord if you want us to host a party. We are pretty good at hosting parties historically. I think it'd be fun and we could like have a hackathon and everyone can build stuff with it. We'll get a bunch of GPUs and, and just see what we can make. All right, oh, maybe. listen to this. Sorry, this is important. Um, yes, llamas are edible and their meat is considered a delicacy in some cultures, particularly in South America where they're native. It's oh. high in protein, low in fat and has a mild flavor often described as a cross between beef and lamb. This is Yum. good. This is a good uh, discussion about the model benchmarks. Uh, that I'll you, ask it for a recipe. We, <laughs> our podcast has confirmed you can eat llama. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you said this is important. Too. Anyway, moving on. So Claude 3 Opus, for those listening, is 84.9 on the human <coughs> eval benchmark score. And llama 3, 400 billion parameter, already, it's still in training, is 84.1. So it's better, allegedly, on this benchmark than Claude 3 Opus. It absolutely is better already than Gemini Ultra. 10 points. Remember that model? Gemini Ultra. Um, and the it's, hidden model. <laughs> it's also better than Gemini Pro 1.5. And it's not there with the new GPT-4 Turbo, but it's not far behind. I mean, it's like three basis points here or three points, however you want to call it. So that the, I mean, come on, this is super exciting. And I think if there's some sort of training ceiling being reached, I'm doubtful there is, but if there is, um, then, then this is going to give the ecosystem some, like some absolute meat. meat I should know it. this, but do they have, do they mention context window in the 400 billion version? No, but that's this is this is where I kind of got a little bit sidetracked earlier, where I tried to pivot to the uh, new assistance API, which we'll cover in a minute. But we had that paper in the week also from Meta, and I wanted to try and like piece this together, right? So they said they're going to improve that context window, um, and they've got something pretty exciting coming on that front. And then we had uh, Megalodon, Megalodon the efficient LLM pre-training. Just to be clear, inference. I don't think you can eat the meat of megalodons. Hopefully, so we, 
Yeah. We will not be having a Megalodon. No Megalodon party. will be. So Megalodon, efficient LLM pre-training and inference with unlimited context length. And so this was a paper by Meta AI talking about a uh, somewhat of a, a breakthrough to, to have unlimited context, unlimited. So we talk about uh, this idea of like a 200, uh, 200K token context window on something like Anthropic's Claude this is saying it's unlimited and it can retain attention. Um, Chris, do you want to talk through this a little bit? I do. Firstly, what do you think a Megalodon is? Do you know? Isn't it? It's Without... from some like show or cartoon or something, isn't it? Like Because a... Meta AI says Megalodon being an extinct species of shark oh, is yeah. not available for cooking. I thought it was a dinosaur. Yeah, well, it not it from the like... Um, that age like sharks live when the dinosaurs did or something oh, right. yeah okay yeah like that stat that like sharks are older than trees or whatever yeah it is. yeah it's probably okay. like that all right fine I, I can't eat it so i'm less interested but regarding the unlimited context um the the interesting thing about it is it's almost like like reading the paper it's almost like they're using a form of memory the way we talk about it with large language models where it basically once it exceeds the size of the context window it has this thing called compressive memory and it has a compressive memory model that it starts to accumulate things in it's unclear to me how it decides what to accumulate in that compressive memory but basically once it runs out of context space it'll start to use that there but what's interesting about it is that in their examples, they talked about doing needle in a haystack studies where they'd put one random number in the entire context, which was they were testing with a million tokens. So not necessarily, I mean, you can't test with unlimited tokens, but they tested with a million and they were able to identify that particular number. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Like if you're using a sort of compressed memory that that is obviously compression by, well, assuming it's lossy compression, as in you lose some of the information when you compress it, it seems odd to then test, you know, getting a specific item. I, I would have thought the idea of unlimited context is it's almost like a form of rag in the sense that you can have this massive context window. It can identify ideas and concepts and themes and, and answer questions based on that knowledge without having necessarily that resolution down to the pixel perfect number or word or whatever it is, but they're sort of saying it can. So. It's interesting reading the paper. Like I, I was, I was struck by the fact that they really struggled to give examples of where this would be used. Like there were, it was sort of like, we're doing it because we can. And like their, their comment at the end is that the goal is to advance human well-being. And I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. That like good on you. But like how, I don't really understand how, if you've got a 1 million token context window, what does a 2 million token context window get you that a 1 million doesn't? Like at what stage are you, are you requiring so much input information in a single decision point that it's needed? So like, let's think about the concept of like an AI Android, right? Not one that just does your dishes, but like one that's like a part of the family. Like, you know, it, it becomes your child or whatever. When you're, when you're thinking as a human, you make hundreds of decisions or you make lots of thoughts about different pieces of information. You don't wait and accumulate like all of the knowledge from the day and then make one big friggin' decision. You're like, okay, here's the answer. You know, it's an ongoing process and thoughts generate other thoughts. And do you know what I mean? It's, it's almost like that mixture of experts model where there's lots of, of, processes going on there isn't just like one big one so what i struggle with is outside of rag based examples which is what they give why you need like why an infinite context window matters other than the fact you can do it with technology wouldn't it be more about finding patterns in huge amounts of data you know like that capability like capabilities that human brains don't have um, I mean, we kind of do, but at a granular level where we really can take into account all that, all that information at once. I suppose so. Yes. And I would bring it back to though, needle in a haystack is one thing, but can it 
have the right level of attention on all of the different parts of that context such that it's giving reasonably consistent output. My fear when I use really large contexts, even with the models we have now, even with 128K even, um, is, is it taking all of this into account or not? One thing I've started to do with my larger prompts is I, when I give it an output format, I force it to output a list of, say, numbers, let's say, that demonstrate that it understood that part of the context. So, for example, say I've given it 20 tables of data. I'm like, give me the data from row three of table four in your answer, as well as your answer, to sort of to sort of acknowledge the fact that it's it's taken that into account. And I've found, at least for my use case, that that actually gives better results. And so my fear with the massive, large context windows is, okay, I can shove everything in there and that's really convenient for me, but is it all being used in a way, as opposed to if I did a bunch of smaller large language model calls got the summaries of the results of each and then put them into a larger into a larger request or a medium sized request or whatever it is would i get better results and yeah but i, I think, think you're you're talking about you know making sense of data that you have like you you understand the sort of inputs that you need and the outputs that you want to get whereas i feel like with the infinite context like you know maybe you don't understand the 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 inputs and outputs as as well like i feel like you're looking through the lens of one very specific use case which is like i i need to take this huge chunk of data and turn it into something whereas do you know what i mean like you, yeah, you've I, got I control variables saying. like there may be yeah, there may be discoveries to be made in large pieces of data that we're not even aware of what they are like for example and if you are watching a video on YouTube and there's a dress that someone's wearing. <laughs> and you... <laughs> I almost spat out my water. That's yeah, funny. but anyway, I like How so. How do I buy this dress? Yeah. It's the biggest problem we all face in modern society. <laughs> but what what was interesting also, just to cross reference this paper, is Google also released a paper. Google's new technique gives LLMs infinite context. This was on, on VentureBeat. And then, of course, the paper is Leave No Context Behind, Efficient Infinite Context Transformers with Infinity Attention. So it seems like this is like this is something everyone's obviously looking into solving so that there's no such thing as a context window. Yeah, and I think they're moving beyond the architecture of just transformers. They have other techniques now to get similar results and this is what they're exploring and i think that's interesting i guess i'm always just trying to translate it into to practical yeah things. like how because, would you how would you use it yeah because the i think the other factor you need to think about is the speed and i know that not everything has to be fast but a lot of the applications we talk about with ai relates to its interaction with the real world so if it's understanding say large chunks of video or audio being able to act like there's a there's a vast difference between being able to sort of post process that kind of information and make inferences and be able to do it on the fly as it's happening because the second you get to on the fly you can take actions whereas if it's all done in this one big post processing thing that'll be interesting in some realms but a lot of the realms we look at like if you look at meta with the metaverse they want to be able to make those inferences in real time they have to 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 apply it in their their weird ether world or whatever. And then there's also things like we talk about like surveillance and those kind of things. Again, real-time interactions. And Android, you need real-time interactions. So the larger context is cool because you can do more stuff, but it the if it's if it's really slow, I would argue a lot of cases can be covered by many more smaller requests. And I know I am in very narrow in, in my view of, of what I'm saying here, but um, I, I'd love to hear good use cases for bi like massive requests. And maybe uh, it's I... just AI making the next generation of AI and using it to make AGI. But this is, this is what I see it as more like it, it's allowing future models or future capabilities that we don't yet know exist to, to, to take their time, like to actually 
do deep thinking on a huge amount of corpus of data. Like imagine you fed it in its context, all the uh, information we know about building rockets and space travel. And you said, hey, buddy, take your time here with this new <laughs> theoretical model, you know, and uh, yeah. take a deep breath sort of thing. Your, your dead grandmother needs a rocket to get out of this solar system and survive. You need to design it, come back. He's everything we know. And, and maybe that by having that infinite context in that scenario, I'm not saying this is necessarily the best use case ever, but uh, maybe that's the sort of the step to extracting this like in, insane value out of these future uh, models that, that we one don't of the, yet one have. One of the things they mentioned in the Google paper specifically was lack of training data that dealt with a large context. So they were saying a lot of the data it's trained on is not being done with large context windows in mind. So it's sort of, they're doing a traditional LLM training, but then they're extending the context window just to see how that performs. So I think this may be another case where we get back to synthetic data examples produced by larger models. So let's say you use Gemini 1.5, um, 1 million contexts to get the AI to make synthetic examples suitable for training a model with infinite or much larger context. And it's giving examples where it's, you know, 700,000 tokens input and then a desired output that may actually yield better results. But I can't think of how you could possibly do it with real data. You'd almost certainly have to do it with synthetic data because it would just be incredibly expensive and time consuming to get real stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think bringing this back to what we were originally talking about, which is the upcoming Llama 3 400 billion parameter model being at a like GPT-4 level model, it just begs the question with these papers and especially the paper from Meta, are we going to see this technology actually in that 400 billion parameter model? And I'm speculating out of excitement here but maybe when they say they're going to improve context window, it's like, yeah, we're just ending that. Like, he's an open <laughs> yeah, source like model. Yeah, like we've improved it to the point of infinite. Yeah, it's just infinity now. It's GPT-4 level, and we're going to distribute it to everyone and give th free access to 3 billion users. Like, bye-bye, Sam. Like, that's what it feels like. He's wearing a chain in the introduction video. I mean, let's go back to the start of the episode. He's wearing this, like, silver badass chain. He's now doing M MMA fighting or whatever he does. Maybe this is his big, like, drop the mic kind of I'd thing. I'd love to know what, and I guess you could probably find out because it's a public company, but what, how, they're, how they're phrasing this to investors. Like, we're spending tons of money making something that rivals the absolute best in class here, maybe better um, by the time we're done with the 400 billion one. And we're just letting anyone who wants to use it and iterate on it and things like that. Like, I'd love to know what they're saying the motivation behind it is because I love it. I think it's great. But as a company, like when I think through a corporate mindset, I just can't get my head around how you can quantify the benefit to the company of doing that. Well, I mean, his net worth just overtook Elon Musk. So I think that, you know, that's probably... Good it's enough. literally just a fucking... Oh, sorry, I'm not meant to swear. It's literally just a... <laughs> there was a light sensor <laughs> that'll fix it um it's he's just like got the ai just like getting to make decisions based on what makes the stock price go up you know like those ais that play video yeah. games and the, they're glitching the game and stuff just doing anything to get the score go up maybe that's just how zuckerberg's operating it's literally like join mma that that seems to help you know like wear a chain and all these decisions are, are purely driven by the the here to four unreleased. I just think they, they sell ads. They want engagement in their apps. AI is a great engagement tool right now. Everyone wants to use it. Everyone wants free AI. How do you sell ads against AI? Google can't do that because you're talking to Gemini in this chat interface. You can't just slide in ads because then you don't trust it. But if I'm in Instagram or WhatsApp or any of their apps all day, every day, if I've got the glasses on, if I'm addicted to the, their AI, I'm using it all the time and then I'm using their app so I can see ads. They can figure out what I'm talking to AI for to get it's better so at targeting. It's so funny because Silicon Valley, the TV show, totally predicted this. There's a scene where the one of the guys is wearing VR goggles and he's like, look at this, I'd like to go 
on holidays and then like a a, a blimp flies past <laughs> in the virtual world with an ad for holidays and then he's like they're talking about like making money or something and he's like oh yeah i want to get down and dirty with money i want to do whatever and he starts to talk like that and then there's all these porn hub ads <laughs> that come across but it's like they were they were spot on that's almost certainly what's going to happen yeah i mean this is all about just getting better ad targeting data than google like he i think he's smart he pivoted at the right time out of the sort of silly metaverse with no legs into into ai and a lot of people are like oh he's just a copycat follower but he's very good at copycatting and commercializing the hell out of this stuff mm. and so you know we will see definitely just very anecdotally but in my mind yeah the 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 view i have of meta was sort of like dying dying company for like people our age basically like no younger people use it to a company that made a series of shrewd acquisitions and then successfully pivoted away from a bad idea into a good one yeah and i mean look the the metaverse and a lot of this investment around augmented reality like as I was saying to you before we recorded the show, the Ray-Ban Meta glasses, even though I don't have the AI yet, but they did say that it's now coming to the glasses through an update um, in Australia, which I'm excited about. So, it, it, I mean, it's already my favorite tech device. I literally use it every day. I love being able to like do photo and videos and listen to audio and having an omnipresent AI at the level of Llama 3 attached to my head that I can talk to. Like I probably would, for quick recall of things, even if I'm writing code, probably just ask the the glasses if I was like. Yeah, that's interesting. You know. So I'm I look. I think that they've made some pretty smart decisions, and as everyone knows, this is an investment advice podcast. Um, and so <laughs> I would buy Meta. Uh, yeah. So anyway, pivoting along here, I'll get back to my my segue that I screwed up before, which is uh. The tooling that I was talking about is—is is this tooling going to become important? And um, OpenAI, remember that company that they—they they, uh, started this whole thing, really. Uh, <laughs> but they did announce a, a pretty major update to the Assistance API, and these are like many improvements that people in the community have been asking for. Um, the main highlights are just being able to do retrievals, or um, what we refer to sometimes on the show as RAG. Um, up to 10,000 files now in the assistance API. This is an API to build <clears throat> essentially like little AI agents with a bunch of, bunch of functions. Have they stopped calling them GPTs, have they? Well, it's always been the assistance API um, and I assume that's behind the GPTs in their interface. So <clears throat> GPTs is like their marketing for AI agents on um, chat GPT and then the assistance API has always been the assistance API. Gotcha. Um, so 10,000 files per assistant, um, that's 500 times more than before. That's a funny way to phrase it. Um, I thought just some of the interesting takeaways is just around that, that file, um, search and the vector store. So it automatically passes the files, chunks them and embeds them. So you can do search across them, um, on that vector store. They haven't released any information about how they're actually doing it because they're open, um, and they don't <laughs> release anything. Um, you can, I think a control for developers, which is great, is you can now control the maximum number of tokens on the runs for the assistance. So you can cost control if you're rolling out assistance broadly. Like, again, I, I go back to that intercom example. If they were using something like this to deliver the servers, you, you could uh, control the costs. Um, I question why would you? Because you'd want full control, but what? Well, yeah. You know. Um, they've also added support for tool choice. So you can force it to use specific tools, essentially like force it to use specific function calls like file search code interpreter or a specific function that you can add into it. Um, yeah, so a whole bunch of updates there. I thought the other interesting tidbit was you can actually uh, get it to use your own fine tune model of GPT 3.5. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and then the it now supports streaming, which it didn't support before, which was kind of a pretty big weakness. And they've released uh, streaming and polling helpers in Node and Python SDK libraries. Now, why I think this is just worth covering is it's a pretty damn good update if you're using the Assistance API. But secondly, it sort of goes back to this point of, of is the tooling going to lock people into ecosystems? Like if, I, if I'm just writing, if I want to spin up 
some AI features and functions with RAG and um, a bunch of function calls and keep track of the conversation and all that work that people have been doing in, you know, in code and having to build from scratch or figure out the right way to do it. If I can just use their Python SDK, is this like, is this the sort of, am I just going to go and do that instead of like going to Azure and spinning up Llama 3 and then having to build the tooling around it? Or again, does the open source community here come through and, and build all that tooling as well? Yeah, it's a tricky one because everything you described, I have, like I've built in modules and stuff. So I'm sort of out of the market for this. It sounds great and all those things are needed, but I would feel like how can someone be capable enough as a developer to use this stuff, but not capable enough to realize how simple it is to implement yourself where you have full control. Like maybe if you're building a brand new product and you want something that's robust that you can then hand on to someone else, this would make sense because you use the canonical libraries and go, okay, here it is. The problem I've found with all of the SDK releases from the various uh, providers is they change so unbelievably rapidly, including changing their interface. So for example, in Sim Theory, there's a lot of work just keeping up with the latest module releases because they'll they'll change how they initialize, they'll change how which parameters the functions take and whatever, and that's all fine. But the question is, do you want to go even further down that path and and hitch your wagon to all of their tooling only to realize they abandon it or change it or whatever. And then you're left with this sort of half implementation where you've got to start to replace bits with your own stuff. I just want, I just don't see it as that useful, but I also do see why they're doing it because it's needed and it, it pushes people in the right direction. Yeah. I think just getting like, you know, people to toy around with it and play around with it. You also don't know what's coming, like potentially gpt 5s around the corner and it can do things like go off and complete tasks and using an assistance api type paradigm might become more important we don't know i mean you can only speculate but i do think the the one thing i'd call out is why google gemini has been just such a disaster i think in the developer community is it we, we joked about it last week and it's just so hard to like find an api key or, or get set up and and using it and i Think that's where OpenAI have excelled it's just you know there's great documentation great libraries there's all that support there and i'm sure we'll get it for llama 3 but you know it's it seems to be that accessibility is really important as well and popularity yeah, like a good example uh last week we talked about gemini the code assistant thing that you can use in vs code and i said i was going to try that out but i was having issues because i didn't know like what project it was associated with and all this stuff. I abandoned that like 10 minutes after the podcast last week because I had to log in again. Like literally every time I went back to VS Code, like not even close it and open it. Every time I went back, it's like log in, choose the project this is associated with. And I'm like, there is no way this thing is doing enough good for me that I'm going to go through this every time I develop. And it's extremely painful. And someone pointed out in our chat, uh, in our, our This Day in AI Discord, that possibly the reason for this is because you've got the the guys in the boiler room making the models, like making Gemini 1.5, then all of the tooling is done with a sort of disconnect from that. And they've all got their own ideas about how it should be made accessible to people. And there's just some sort of disharmony at Google where they just can't get that, that process right. But yeah, every every other... AI related release we use, I think of fondly, like, and I keep bookmarks to them and I can get in in a few seconds. Whereas Google, like, if you're like, can you go make something in Gemini? I'll be like, all right, here we go. Like, it's, it's just really, really hard to work with. Yeah. And I think it's like jokingly, attention is all you need. Like, attention on your model and your tooling and your ecosystem is what is really needed if you want to to win the AI wars in terms of like models and tools and get developers, like developers, developers, developers is true. And what, what I kind of find a bit strange about all this is that uh, Logan Kilpatrick, who was the developer evangelist over at OpenAI and has since left and joined Google, which is interesting. Uh, he was obviously communicating great with developers about open AI. In fact, he was just a huge source of information and, um, and like 
kind of very supportive to developers when all that turmoil was going on, calming people down and being like, hey, you know, pointing them to documentation and, and doing all that stuff. And he actually, through the week, has uh, come out and said, you know, what can we do to improve and make it easier to build on AI Studio and Gemini API? And I don't know if it was like a fake comment, but on our last YouTube video, he also commented and said like, you know, feedback taken when we were ranting about them, <laughs> shitting hard yeah. on them. Um, so it is good to see that they've got someone now that's representing reasoning and admitting the mistakes and saying, hey, we might try and fix the, th this. But he has a lot of work cut out for him, that guy. Yeah. If, if he's I gonna... mean, like if I was speaking, like if he is listening and I was speaking directly to him, I'd be like, give some clarity around Gemini Ultra. Like, is it released or isn't it? And is it much better? Like, should we be trying it? Why is the context window so small? Like, that's what I'd like to know about that one. And the second one is with the with the actual deployment of Gemini models, I'd be like, just simplify it. Just give everyone with a Google account an API key and a way to be billed for it and just have one section where you go to that's like gemini.google.com where you've got the chat interface on one hand and a developers tab with docs where you can just get developing on it and just bypass all that other crap. Like yeah. all this all this app builder vertex AI like shit. No, I, I don't know anyone who knows what any of that means. And I just don't think people are as loyal to the Google ecosystem as they are to other systems. And I just feel like if you want to get the wider AI community trying your stuff, you just need to simplify it right down. Then as that technology matures and you want to become more enterprisey, do that. But don't start where it's so complicated. You need like a registered Gemini 2.0 consultant to actually even understand how to get into the thing. I think the problem is you've also got the Google Cloud strategy similar to Amazon. Like we'll host your models, we'll host the open source models, we'll host anything type scenario. And then you've got them also having their proprietary models. They're trying to be like, you know, an Amazon and an Anthropic yeah. almost at the same time. Yeah, and I just struggle to think like, I mean, sorry, I can think like the reason you would probably want those other models hosted by Google is if you're locked into some minimum spend with them and you need to run your AI stuff with them to to make sure you're not like double paying or whatever it is. Like I sort of get that, but again, it does muddy the waters in terms of messaging. Like it makes sense for Amazon because let's face it, has anyone even heard about Amazon's own LLM again since they announced it? No, but you do know that if you want to host mainstream models, you can do it on Amazon as part of that ecosystem, like using their bedrock thing. But Again, it's not exciting and it's not Speaking interesting. Of easy Amazon interfaces. isn't exactly trying to be the best LLM out there. They're just trying to be a host, which is what they are. Whereas Google is trying to be the best LLM. So they should make that the primary focus of their messaging. The only focus. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll watch. Also, it sorry, one last point. It seems to me like Gemini's two biggest capabilities over the others is the 1 million context window and the capabilities to natively understand audio and video. To me, they should be just hammering that point home, like making that the only point that they're focused on and, um, and, and simply just driving use cases home and showing how people can use that in their applications. I think, and also just being honest about the, uh, the, the hallucinations and how to avoid them, because every time I've tried it, it's hallucinated I've never actually got it to work. And I've tried it many times um, with with audio, with video and various other things. And so you see the sort of AI influence of fanboys on Twitter being like, oh my God, and having exclusive access. But then and that hypes it up, it, it works. And then you actually go and try it like we do on this show and it just doesn't work. And you're like, it was all lies. Like where are the fanboys gone now? They've moved on to the next hype hype train that they're trying to pump up yeah and I, li I like your point there which is don't deny that it exists just say hey we know here's how here's great prompts that will get you around that here's how to structure it when you're talking about a video to make sure it stays on point and that kind of assistance to the developer would would lead to more people bothering to try it here's how to buy an agent that helps you buy dresses from youtube <laughs> I'll never let that go. All right. Yeah, you gotta you gotta know your audience. Like no one who fits the profile of what that video was about is going to try Gemini. None. Like it, it just isn't useful.
Yeah, I mean, trying to appeal to like a broad set of people um, when it's all high tech people, men and women at that Google Cloud conference is just, uh, it made no sense. Anyway, moving well, and on. Also, like anyone who's in the scenario where they're watching a video and want to buy a dress, they'll see the little AI thing pop up and either use it or not. They're not going to be like, oh, this is powered by G Google Gemini 1.5 million context. They don't give a shit. They're just, they just want to buy the dress or whatever. Like it, there's no need to advertise that capability. And it's also not a use case that any developers at your conference are interested in. All right. I think, I think we've made the point. We've, yeah. like, we've done over like 20 minutes over two shows. Bad demo. Yeah. Um, all right. So a little update on the Connor, our recording artist Connor, as everyone does recall. Chris obviously wrote a, a master, a Connor masterpiece earlier in the episode with the it's, uh it's the one of the song. best things i've ever created in my life i love that song a doctor of cheese, a doctor of cheese. Large models. it's really good i love it. it all right so uh anyway so connor situation through the week i was like i want to keep this prank going i think if we could try and just take it a little bit further it would be fun and uh and so what what could I do to keep the prank going? And I thought, oh, a deep fake. Like if we could have a FaceTime or a video call and pretend to be Connor and we spoke the words or typed the reply and then it could instantly, you know, sort of like deep fake being Connor, this like innocent new upcoming recording artist. Maybe we could get on a call with the, the major record label and try and actually like get at least like a term sheet of a deal for this new artist. So then what fell into my lap? What could it be? But Microsoft's new uh, example, this VASA VASA 1, lifelike audio driven talking faces generated in real time, the exact technology I would need to keep this prank alive for Connor. Uh, so I looked into it, I got extremely excited. And, and for those that can't see the screen, uh, it, what it essentially does is, and Chris mentioned it earlier on the show, is it's a photo, a photo. You just take a photo or create an AI image of someone like Connor and it will literally animate it, make it look 3D and lip sync and basically do all that in real time. And, and there's an example at the bottom of the paper where you just put in a prompt and click generate and then the talking face moves exactly how you want. Let me just head I'll put an example contribute up. Contribute to the perception of authenticity and liveliness. So you can, in this interface that you obviously can't access, they, they've got like pitch your role. So it, it fully creates a 3D persona. The lip syncing's great. I mean, you can tell, look, it, it, at times that it's an AI, but I think with like a poor quality Zoom call, you could maybe get away with it. Unfortunately, uh, what was quite sad about uh, VASA 1 is because of safety, we're not going to get it. So that kind of like killed off my dream of doing this call. Um, the video uh, examples are beautiful. I've tried other two other systems, one called Synesthesia and one called D slash D hyphen ID. I find the latter DID is better, but the main limitations are it's not real time. Um, it's close to it, but it's not real time. And it, uh, you can tell it's AI, like it's decent and it's good. It's good as an avatar, but the examples we see there in Microsoft's one, I, I mean, I'd go further than you. I think you absolutely could convince someone on a zoom call at this point. Like there's no, I mean, unless it glitched out during it, like as long as you could get consistent performance and you could make any glitches look like lag, for example. I would believe it. it. It's really, really good. Probably the only thing is you need to have things like maybe messy hair or a messy background or some sort of, you know, thing to sort of uh, a bit of static in there to make it look a bit more like real life. Like not everyone's like perfectly done up for every call. Maybe it's just our industry, but I don't know. Yeah, the backgrounds are probably the biggest giveaway. But if, yeah, if you could sort of crop the base elements out and then have a more realistic feeling background then yeah i can totally see it passing it's just a shame they don't release stuff like this like i know like oh safety whatever but i mean it's really ruining my connor prank here and i'm i really yeah exactly it was just, it would just have been so much fun to try i read the paper 
And it's interesting because basically what they said is the reason theirs is so good is that their model considers all face dynamics, not just the lips. Like most previous models focused on the lips. And you'll see in their examples, you can have an emo like a sort of background emotion that the avatar is feeling while they're talking. So they can be happy and they'll sort of like I am now, like a bit of smiling while they're talking, or they could be like pissed off and and a bit like that. And it it looks quite cool because it's not just like they say whatever they want to say, then they frown. It's like they're actually incorporating it into the facial dynamics while they're speaking, which is damn cool. Like it look and again, it's unfortunate that we just see cherry pick the examples. You can't try it because I can imagine usually in these cases the reality is not quite as good as they show but geez we know we're going to get there and it's it's really interesting yeah there's actually, no doubt you could talk to an ai agent soon using this it says our method generates video frames 5 12 by 5 12 at 45 frames a second in an offline batch processing mode and can support 40 frames per second in an online streaming mode 40 frames a second with 170 milliseconds that's like aren't movies 25 frames per second it's like it's better than it's a movie. It's better. And that's on a desktop, a single NVIDIA RTX 4090 GPU. I have one of those. That's great. That's, that's, um, geez, that's exciting. That's really cool. Yeah. Like, so, I mean, but I, it was funny. I was going to, I was going to steal these ideas as my own, but I'll just admit it. I read them on Reddit and I found them <laughs> hilarious. Someone's like, Your Honor, we have a confession from the subject. That's like number one fear of the technology. Second one is, what is the non-evil use case for this? <laughs> I like that comment. And the other one was, I can't have a, I can't wait to have a Zoom meeting with one of these things. It is true. What other non-evil, like it, it, it's very. Literally most people are going to, for a while, spend their jobs talking to AI avatars from other companies who couldn't be bothered coming to the meeting and just the AIs will summarize for each other what the AIs talked about. And then you'll get the summaries, discuss the summaries, and then send them out to do something else. But it really is. I really, really need to make sure I have a job that isn't in the corporate space by the time this stuff uh, becomes mainstream because it's going to be depressing. The but the, the, the in the week that there, there, there was like a cartoon interview thing, like where they were like, "Oh, it handles pre-screening interviews," and they have to talk to this cartoon thing. I mean, imagine how humiliating for the job applicant having to talk to an AI cartoon on a video chat. But I mean, <laughs> at least this would make it like feel like it could be a human. <laughs> Although it, you raise an interesting point, like why does everything have to be hyper realistic? Why not just talk to Bugs Bunny while you're doing your Zoom? <laughs> just, just have like these just crazy weird things, like and like new identities, like Connor. He could be like the best job interviewer out there. All right, we have talked for uh, more than enough time today. Uh, but yeah, exciting times. Llama three. Uh, it is in the wild. We'll do a, a little bit more uh, reporting on it in, in subsequent shows and, and let you know all the good stuff that's happening with Llama 3. And if you want to go check it out, you can do it right now at meta.ai. We'll also have an unhinged version of Llama 3 shipping uh, soon to Sim Theory. While I mention Sim Theory, uh, we sent an email out to people who had signed up to Sim Theory at, at simtheory.ai during the week just to get some feedback about how people were using it. We've decided to sacrifice our bodies and our time um, on evenings and weekends and, and roll out a pretty major update to Sim Theory starting pretty soon. Um, so there's going to be a, a beta available. Um, there's a beta channel now on the Discord. I did want to bring up on the screen a quick sneak peek. So we've incorporated a ton of feedback into the new system. Um, I, I'll start by saying it's going to be insanely smoking fast. Um, the UI will be more fast and modern and fluid. None of that jumpiness and all the um, all the clunkiness that that we have right now. Um, a few other things you'll be able to easily switch between agents in the same conversation. Eventually, you'll be able to invite multiple agents into a conversation, which is pretty cool, like a group chat scenario. Um, switching models as well, controlling more model parameters, vision models. Um, or, you know, just having full control and being able to do that in real time without having to go in and edit instructions and the slowness. Um, a agent creation will be instantaneous. There'll be like zero, zero low time there. Um, and then a whole bunch of other things. Everything you know and love about Sim3 right now will be back, like memory, file handling, um, a new image creation and editing interface. So th there's a whole heap 
to it. Obviously, it's a lot of work for us to build this out. It may take us the rest of the year or into next year, but we're just going to release it in small iterations as we have time. And um, the feature I'm most looking forward to is automation of model testing. So we're going to split the screen and do blind testing of models and image creation tools and vision. So when a new model is released on the show, we can get all the users to run their own tests, like their own versions of the tests and roll those tests up into a this day in AI model score and have our official own benchmarking on the this day in AI website. So that's our vision and dream for this as a sort of companion tool and app to the show. Um, and yeah, so if you um, want to check it out, uh, make sure you do get signed up to simtheory.ai. More info in the Discord. Um, thanks for all the support on that project. It, it, it's just something we do for love and like the passion of AI and, and playing around with it. And it helps teach us a ton about things. So um, yeah, we appreciate it. And we'll keep sharing updates when we have them. Chris, any final thoughts on the Llama 3 special edition episode? That's what I'm now calling it. I'm just going to try it some more and give some feedback on the channel. All right. I might play us out quickly with uh, just that cheese cheese tune again. Oh. Fermented milk, yeah. Fermented milk, yeah. Large language models. If it passed with flying colors, it's a model supreme. Cheese will reveal. But if it fails, then just a curdled dream. I'm gonna fall asleep to this tonight.